The Close Weekly brings you the most actionable advice for today's real estate market. We'll unpack what you need to know to move the needle in your business in a real way. This podcast is brought to you by Premier Real Estate Agent Training Program, The Close Pro. Go to theclose.com slash podcast to learn more and to get $25 off. Now, here's your host, the man who has been a top producing agent for over 25 years, Sean Modry. Good morning, Close listeners. This is Sean Modry, and we are back with the Close Weekly Podcast. And today we have a great guest, Jay O'Brien from Client Giant. And he is going to hear, he's here today to share with us some more information about 2022. Good morning, Jay. Good morning. Thanks for having me, Sean. I appreciate it. Yeah. Now, oh, you're in Carlsbad, right? No, no. I'm in um, Costa Mesa. I'm in uh, Orange County, Southern oh, California. Oh, well. Uh, close. Yeah. Kind of close to Carlsbad, but <laughs> that'd be North San Diego. We're like kind of central Orange County. So Yeah, close. I'm not suspecting you have snow on the ground. Absolutely not. But no. what but what's crazy is you can actually look outside and see snow on the mountains. Oh. Uh, so so one side is the ocean and the other side is snow on the mountains. It's pretty wild. Oh man, that, I'm I'm so jealous right now. Can you yeah, actually it's pretty beautiful. go snowboarding and surfing the same week? Like is that doable there? You can do it the same day. Same day. Oh. Yeah. All right. People I, do I it see all a the trip time. in my future. I'm gonna come yes. to your house. I highly recommend it. I oh. highly recommend it. It's fantastic. I love it, man. I love it. I'm sitting, I just finished snow blowing. So, uh, oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. It's a different life. Where, where are you again, Sean? Just south of Boulder. Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Yeah. Tis yeah. the season. He's the season. Yeah. I was, <laughs> I'm actually literally like two miles south of the fire, the big fire. Oh, no. So, yeah. is everything good with you guys? Yeah, my kids, you know, I have adult kids and they, um, one of them goes to see you and the other two live in Superior. So they all got evacuated, but everybody was safe. No, no damage to anything. But uh, yeah, right now we're, we're trying to assist, you know, around here, we're all trying to assist with the cleanup and figuring out how to, how to help people. But with the massive low inventory, they need houses. And the problem is, is we can buy them couches and, you know, dishes and clothes and toys and all that stuff but we can't buy them a house, you know? Right. I mean, yeah. And we That's can't true. buy a thousand of them. And there's not, there's not a thousand homes even active in this part of the, the city right now. <laughs> so I know that seems to be the trend uh, nationwide. It's the super, yeah. super low inventory. Yeah. So on that, you know, our main focus today on the podcast is really to cover the 2022 trends um, for the first quarter. And so let's start with that one. Let's talk about the inventory. Do you see listing inventory increasing this year? I mean, I, I, I do. And I mean, full disclaimer, I'm not an economist or anything like that. But, you know, if you just gravitate toward the numbers and and halfway through 2022, they're predicting that, you know, the interest rates are going to go up. They're, they might go up faster or even more significantly than they originally anticipated. So that's naturally going to shift supply and demand a bit. Um, I, it's hard to imagine inventory being any lower than it is now. So I think yeah. that's only going to go up. I've, I've already seen, um, slowdowns in different pockets and price reductions in different pockets. You know, the second home, uh, vacation mm -hmm. home areas, um, are typically the first to go and you start to see those getting a little more stagnant and then a little price reduction. And, you know, at this phase in the game, it's hard to tell if it's, uh, if it's overpriced you know, because everyone gets super ambitious and they see this upward trend. So they just keep seeing how, how much they can test that elasticity. And then at a certain point, you don't get bites, you come back down. Are you coming back down below market value? Or are you coming down to market value? You know, right. Um, right. but I absolutely am seeing stagnant listings in certain pockets right now and, um, and price reductions. So I think in general, I'm hopeful that there will be some sort of path to normalization in 2022, but um, you know, all I can really do is read the reports and see what other people are predicting and go off yeah. of the data. So that's kind of my, my prediction. I hate to admit it, but I'm kind of, I'm kind of rooting for interest rate increases. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's bound to happen. It has to happen. Right. I mean, geez, it's like in certain pockets here um, out in the desert, for example, Palm Springs, that area I've seen, home values in the last 18 months double. I mean, a hundred percent increase. That is 
insane. So it's just not healthy. It's got to, it's got to get, you know, fixed. And so I think that actually goes into a lot of what I think real estate agents should focus on in 2022, which is the idea of, you know, 2020, 2021, it's like an agent is good when everything is good, you know? Mm. Um, but similar to how I started my company and, and really forget my company, but what I started doing in my real estate practice in 2014, things were going well. And I think that that is the time to be looking at your business under a microscope the most is um, for me, it was never really the opposite. Like, Oh, things are going bad. What can I do to fix it? It's like, at that point it might be too late. It's like when you're riding a wave, it's like, okay, how, how is this happening? Why is this happening? Why is the good so good? How do I protect that? How do I make my business defensible and start checking all those boxes and being honest with yourself so that when things do stabilize or normalize that you've been proactive with that versus like, oh, things are great. Things are always going to be great. And then boom, 2008 happens, you know? Man, I think that is some of the best advice we've gotten so far. I, I wrote that down. When an agent is good, everything is good. Or, or when, when, every, mark, when everything when everything when, is good and Asian is good. When everything's good. I wrote yeah. it down backwards. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when an agent's good, everything's good too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I, I, I totally agree with you, right? Like don't believe, don't believe your own. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, just be leap that just out. Be, just be real, be honest with yourself. You know, how many people in the last two years have went out and got a real estate license because yeah. they can see they see other agents crushing it. And those people who have never sold real estate a day in their life, they may be made 100 or 200K their first year ever. Um, are they the smartest people? Are they the most experienced or whatever? It, it doesn't matter. The, what matters is that happened. You know, someone trusts them to do that. And if that person wants to continue along in their career, there's a lot of things that need to be recognized, a lot of things that need to be checked before the market kind of reaches some sense of normalcy. You know, I've been in, in real estate. This is my this is going on my 28th year in real estate. Oh, wow. Yeah, I started That's young, fantastic. man. The thing that was the, probably the best defensible thing during the last recession um, in 2008, 2009 was really, um, was really focusing on the database and managing the database. Because what I found is like clients, they just don't reach out, right? When things are going bad, they're embarrassed, they're shy, they try to fix it themselves and make it worse, you know? Um, so that's something that I think is really important. And when a market's good, agents don't, right? They don't yeah. focus on their database at all. Right. And I, I mean, I think about what's happened in the last few years with the inventory being so low, demand being so high, interest rates being so low. And a lot of buyers, for example, come into the market that they're like, hey, I'll do anything and everything just to get this house. I need to go right. through the listing agent. I'll do it. I need to come up to this price. I'll do it. All of these things that at the end of the day would benefit a listing agent in this example. And you can ride that wave for however long you can ride it. But at a certain point, and I believe that we are approaching this point, that it's not going to be so one-sided anymore. And as we, as, as we reach a sense of normalcy in the market and eventually come to an equilibrium, that might not happen in 2022, but I think we're on our way. I think it's important to recognize, in my opinion, there's a parallel between what's about to happen with, with the real estate market the same way as what we've seen happen in the last six months with the great resignation in the career employment mm -hmm. market, mm -hmm. which is basically you've got a ton of employees that go, wait a minute, like, I don't like this job. I'm treated poorly here. I'm not fulfilled. I'm leaving by. Whereas I also see buyers and sellers kind of thinking, geez, like my real estate agent that's making 15, 20 K a deal. They've never done anything for me. They've never done anything personal for me. They've never checked in with me. They just rode this wave and made all this money. Maybe I'll be a little bit more critical who I hire next, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think yeah, they don't care about me, right? Yeah, they don't right, care. Yeah. And, and really in the last few years, um, maybe that wasn't needed, right? If I've got a listing and I've got a product you want, um, I don't need to be nice to you. You'll do anything in the world for it, right? And so you can ride that wave forever. But at a certain point, like, you know, humans do do business with humans. And, you yeah. know, when, when that leverage isn't there anymore and it's not so skewed, mm. I just think as things normalize, 
it's one of those things where you really need to acknowledge what it is that you're bringing to the table as an agent because you can't rely on just the product you have that has you know 100 offers on it and you're competing with two listings that's yeah. That's that's a rare scenario, and I think that rare scenario is going to be depleting, and it's going to start running more toward a normal market as we start going to 2022, 2023. So really, the professionalism and what you're bringing to the table as a real estate agent, your seasoned expertise, your skill set, right, um, all of these variables that really matter, the most important of which I believe is the way you treat somebody – um, if you make someone feel super special, they're going to remember that. You can mm -hmm. find a seasoned guy down the street. Uh, you can find someone who's been in the business for 40 years down the street, but somebody who really impacts you in a in a profound way, that's few and far between. So that would yeah. be I would be betting all in on that sort of thing. Yeah, I love that. I love that. One of the things that you touched on, I'm going to back this up for a minute, is you're talking about, you know, what you're seeing in the market and you know, you're in Southern California. So I saw a stat the other day that 212,000 people moved out of California um, yeah. last year. Um, and I know that uh, um, New York saw a decrease in population. Um, so those people are going somewhere. So like 200,000 populations, it's not a ton to California, but it's a lot to, you know, uh, Nevada. <laughs> like, sure. 200,000 people moving into Nevada. And I think Nevada was up 100,000, which is yeah. a lot considering they really only have two, two large cities, right? Reno and Vegas. Um, yeah. Texas had a, had a huge impact. You know, uh, I think Joe Rogan is independently um, making money off of yeah. Austin, Texas and bringing yeah. wealthy people in. Like, I, I, he sounds like a recruiter. <laughs> I know Austin has been blowing up and uh, I mean, Idaho too, the state of Idaho. Idaho. Yeah. That's, I mean, and so what's happening there is these uh, once secret gems of like, you can get a lot for your money here and it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. The community is great, whatever. Um, now it's like, you really can't get a lot for your money now because you're right to your point. It's like, maybe it's not a lot of people for California, but then you flood a place like Idaho. Well, same thing mm -hmm. happens. You start snatching up all the houses, prices go up. Let's just... Yeah, demand drives those prices up. So I was just thinking, like, I think it's one of the things that we have to acknowledge on here when we talk about the market shifting or declining and population growth moving. What we're talking about, what you and I are talking about, is specific to certain areas where you're going to see, you know, high price points. You know, what you're saying is like areas like California where there's high, high, high. I mean, what's a median home now in your area? Um, I mean, you're at a million dollars, you know, at, at least, um, for, for middle of the road. Yeah. In Colorado, we went from about 480 and in two years we're at 680 for Denver, which mm -hmm. is really high for Denver. I, I mean, I, I don't want to say high, like it's going to fall, but it's, it's higher than it's ever been. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. And, um, so, so higher price point areas, areas where, um, people might be uh, moving away or not encouraged to move to because of affordability are probably going to soften some areas. Like you said, like Idaho, we, you know, Vegas and those areas that are normally perceived as a high, high quality of life and lower cost, which Colorado used to be, we used to, you know, Colorado Springs right. is like growing like crazy here. And, you know, normally it wasn't a big attractor, but it's, you know, about a hundred thousand dollars cheaper down there. So those areas, we might see an increase and you might actually see, somebody might actually see a continued lack of inventory in, in those areas. Is that fair? Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, well, a lot of this stuff might be um, just kind of predictions or whatever. Mm -hmm. Some things are inevitable, which are, which are, we know interest rates are rising and we know what happens when interest rates go up, purchasing power goes down. Or in a lot of cases, that person who was approved to buy something is no longer approved. So right right there alone, like if, if we took every other variable out of the equation, we would know that the buyer pool is going to decrease, mm -hmm. right? Like that's that's going to happen for people who need a loan to buy, which is most home buyers. So if the demand goes down, that already changes the the purchase price, you know, across the board. If I had 10 people looking to buy this house and now I have two, it changes the whole thing. So yeah. I think that's kind of the starting point to recognize is that that is actually happening. Um, everything else, you know, sure, people can look at and make their forecasts and whatnot, but this is pretty, yeah. pretty well known. You, 
I, I was on a call on Monday with a, it was a, an investment firm and they were asking me, they're thinking about putting a plate, you know, doing some investing into uh, some different areas in real estate. And they were interviewing me about kind of my perspective of real estate. And I said, well, the one metric that I haven't got a good handle on is sec the secondary home market because yes, you know, there's not a comparison in 2008 to, to today as far as you know, equity and 100% mortgages, those things are different. Um, appreciation's different, right? We're seeing much greater appreciation right now than we saw back then, right? Sure. So, so what, what comes easy can go easy, right? Like if you made 20% yeah, in a year, you're not going to be that hung up about giving back 20% in a year, right? You're going to be like, well, I lost a year. I didn't lose you know, where, you know, you go back into the early 90s, it took seven years to build 20% equity, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so what comes easy goes easy. And then the other thing I said to them is, I don't know if anybody's really tracking the number of secondary homes that people are owning, because I have a lot of friends that own VRBOs and rental properties that really aren't investors, right? They're just doing it because it sounds like fun or it's a hobby or whatever. And if the market shifts and there's less desire, demand, reward, reward in mm -hmm. those markets, I think you're going to see people start to sell off their secondary homes. And you, you mentioned that. You said that you're seeing uh, the secondary home market slow down. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few variables there and and those sort of things like we'll see how they how they shake out. But I think one thing's for sure, people could work remote um, when COVID hit. So um, a lot of people moved from, you know, San Francisco to Texas or whatever. And we saw a lot of that. But we also saw people park their money in a secondary home. Mm -hmm. um, we saw inflation go through the roof, which is part of this problem, right? Because even though we went like this and yeah, what, what comes easy might go easy. I do believe that it is setting a new floor that's going to be higher than it's ever been, even when there, there's a correction. I do agree um, with that. Mm -hmm. But the secondary home, whether it's for someone's own personal use and utility or as a vacation rental, I think there's two things that are kind of moving there. One, if it's for personal use, Maybe that personal use has reached its maximum over the last two years. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're maybe it's kind of getting back to normal life and maybe you're going back to an office. Maybe you're not able to use that secondary home as much. Who knows? But then the second piece is that a lot of these are Airbnb or VRBO. And those rules and restrictions are changing all of the time. I've had firsthand experience in multiple cities across the country with this different city ordinances that get implemented, different policies with um, the platform itself. And things that are kind of like leaving the homeowner pretty vulnerable, because if you bought a property, um, you know, five, 10 years ago, you buy a property. And for the most part, it's like if it's a secondary home, this is like vacation use. Now you're buying a property and it's like you're buying a business, right? Mm -hmm. You're buying a you're buying a revenue stream. You have the data right there. You can go on websites like AirDNA.com and you can run reports and you can see all the stuff right there. But what it does not tell you is what sort of things are happening with city council right now, what sort of uh, plans are being approved or not approved and things that will, that could turn that off instantly. Um, yeah. I've seen it firsthand. So that's the yeah, other piece on that, that Just to, just to add to that. So Aspen, Colorado has such a housing shortage that they put a, a ban on short-term rentals until they got a handle on the housing shortage. So if you have a, you know, I mean, it's Aspen. So a condo is $2 million, right? A house is going to be, you know, probably 5 million kind of yeah. for a starter kind of house up there. And you're producing 50,000 a month in revenue. It makes sense on that $5 million house, but you're not going to rent to the locals and get 50,000 a month in revenue. Right? right. So all of a sudden the investment no longer makes any sense. And I think that we're going to see, I mean, I, I think we're going to see more of that, unfortunately, because it's, it sucks for the homeowner, right? Like it's like you bought this with this expectation and in a lot of cases with only that expectation, right? Mm -hmm. You don't, it, you, you require the revenue for the whole investment to make sense. And then if the city just shuts it off, which I've seen it happen, you know, you've seen it happen in Aspen. I've seen it happen in Hawaii. I've seen it happen mm. in, in, in the desert. I see it happen in, in Nashville. It's happening like crazy. So, you know, even for me personally as an investor, I'm thinking, 
God, this is going to be a killer Airbnb, but also should probably make sure it's a good long term rental in case that goes sideways or whatever, because you don't know what could happen, you know. So I think that um, a lot of those cities are playing catch up, you know, and they're getting complaints from, you know, different pockets, neighborhoods and whatnot to have to put these policies and, and rules into place that, you know, that's that market might slow down a little bit, too. Yeah, the other thing that I thought was interesting is Denver passed um, a law, and instead of finding the homeowner, okay, if they catch an unlicensed um, short-term rental on a website, they find the website a thousand dollars a day. No way! <laughs> a day. Wow. So now Denver's going after the websites for promoting unlicensed um, short-term rentals. So. That's, that's that's a shift pretty too. crazy. Yeah, mm -hmm. that is definitely a shift. So well, it's because they yeah, couldn't I, they couldn't control it. P people said, I, I don't care. I'll just do it without a license. And the penalties were so low. You know, they're fining people. You know, thousand dollars, two thousand dollars. The people were going, okay, I don't. I'll just pay the. I'll just pay the fine. Sure. Like a speeding ticket. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's cost of doing business, right? Just do it. Keep moving on. We just budgeted yeah. it in. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So I think that's kind of the overarching trend of 2022 that I would be looking out for personally is like with any boom is to to be aware of, you know, how how rare and obscure that is or was. Mm -hmm. And and what does a normal market look like? Have you ever worked in a normal market before? You know, and are you prepared for that? And what happens when you you really do need to compete on a higher level? Uh what are you bringing to the table? What can you honestly say you're bringing to the table? And one of the things I mention a lot is I mentioned earlier the way you treat people, but when people lean on their experience and you know years in the business, area expert, all those things, the thing I think about the most is what what's going to pierce through the, at the surface because for a consumer. That's all that matters. Right? So uh, I, I watched your uh, I watched your interview on Inman from 2018. That was that was pretty cool. I loved your conversation about the Google reviews. I thought that was hilarious because you're a hundred percent right on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean the, the the reviews just I mean there it's a false sense of credibility, right? It just doesn't matter as much as we we give weight to. Yeah, and how you're like um, my review is I showed up on time yeah. and I was prepared. And he's like. Yeah, that's enough. Like, no, it's not yeah. enough. And you said the Uber comment, you said, um, that's like Uber saying, um, I'm going to give you five stars because I got here alive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Doesn't matter what the truth is. If the truth is, I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. I've never done this before. And you're, you're the better choice. Doesn't matter because it's too late. That person's made the decision based on whatever other variable is out there and it's over. So Yep. So that's another thing I would focus on because, you know, in real estate, I mean, God, there's e it's ego central, right? So it's like, man, I, but I'm I'm the pro here. And it's like the me, me, me story. It's like, well, none of that really matters if, it, if you didn't win the business. I'll be totally honest. Like I am one of those agents where, you know, I will go a long time without having a conversation with my clients. <laughs> so hey, at least my you're honest. I, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, I'm nothing but transparent, man. So yeah. I had a conversation this morning with one of my coaching clients and we were having this conversation and he says, he says, uh, I haven't talked to my client in a year. What do I say? So you're the expert at this. You obviously have this figured out. I've always kind of just done things the way I would want them done to me. Right. Or in a lot of ways, not done to me. So when people are like, Oh yeah, I call my clients every quarter and I check in with them. I mean, to be honest, like, I don't want anyone calling me. There's nothing to talk about. Like, it's a waste of my time. Like, you know, my financial advisor called, hey, James, checking in on you, big like, dude, just stop calling, man. Like, this is, this is annoying me, you know? Um, that's not how I receive care or whatever you want to call it. Um, similarly, um, I know a lot of clients that, or a lot of agents that they take their clients to dinner and they take them golfing and they do all this stuff. That's another thing that, like, that's great if it works for you. But for me personally, if I was getting like, hey, my financial advisor wants to take me to dinner, I'd probably be like, dude, I feel like I don't want to do that. And <laughs> I'd rather go to dinner with my buddies or whatever, like my my fiance. I'm just like, it's a it's a nice thought, but I don't want to do it. Like you're a professional in my life, that's cool, but I don't necessarily want to be spending time with you. So for me, I'm a hundred percent with you on that. A hundred percent. Yeah. So when I when I was in um, doing real estate full time, which is pre client giant, so for the, those listening, um, I now run a company called Client Giant, which it does this specifically. It's taking care of people for repeat referral business. But he, he said client 
giant. Client giant, yes. You said it so fast. It sounded <laughs> like Okay, so client giant, yeah, dot com. That's that's the site, and I can get into that in a, in a minute. But um, I would do the client appreciation event once a year, and I've had the same hypothesis as you. Because if I was on the receiving end getting the, the invitation, would I go? I would not. Um, but I tried it out one year. I did it Sunday, five to eight, and it was like trade pass appetizers and drinks, and knocked it out of the park. It was great. So I did it every single year after that, same time frame, same place, and it worked really, really well. So. If you want to try that once a year, go for it. But for me, like every single thing in my life, I'm thinking of like, you know, Tim Ferriss is a minimum effective dose. What's the least I could do with the biggest impact? Yep. Um, and, and for me, going golfing four hours with one client isn't the way to do that. Um, so for me, that's kind of what um, implemented a lot of things I, I was doing throughout a real estate transaction. So I would, for example, I wrote down all the pain points that, um, a buyer or seller has during a deal, stressful um, points in the deal. So what's going on during a normal transaction? Well, that person typically is moving, right? Uh, so they got to change their forwarding address. They got to change uh, their utilities. They need to buy moving boxes. Um, there's all kinds of things that if I could just insert myself in there and proactively take care of those things for that person, it'd probably really be appreciated. Um, so I would do that. So I would just send them moving boxes and packing tape and labels and supplies on like day six of a deal awesome. shows up to their, their current residence. And it's like, Hey, Sean, here's one less thing you need to worry about. And you're just like, Whoa, that was really, really nice. And in the grand scheme of things like the commission I'm about to be paid, that's a drop in the bucket. Right. Um, similarly, I would help with the forwarding of address transfer utilities. Um, lots of people are big on closing gifts. I've really never been big on a closing gift because a closing gift solidifies the end of a relationship. It's over. Um, that's one thing, but the, the even bigger thing is that it feels very quid pro quo. It feels very transactional. It feels like, um, okay, here's an exchange. I really appreciate your trust in all of this. Here's exactly how much I appreciate it. It's here's a two hundred dollar gift card to Lowe's. That feels really right. Um, feels really weak and it feels really cheap and uh, and it, it's not the message I want to be sending. So instead, if I can pepper things along the way to illustrate thoughtfulness but also be helpful in a lot of ways, then I'm going to do that. Similarly, why wait until the closing? Like for me, if a buyer had their loan approved or if a seller had contingencies removed from the, from the buyer, that's a milestone in and of itself. That's something to celebrate right now. That's something where you have a sigh of relief, you know, and everyone's like, oh, okay, cool. This is actually going to happen. Um, I would send either a bottle of wine or like a gourmet gift box or something that's like, hey, congratulations. The hard part's over, Sean. You can sit back and relax, enjoy this, like while we take care of the rest. And you're like, man, that was like a nice little touch, you know? Um, and at closing, always a handwritten card, but nothing else, nothing tangible, because I don't want it to be perceived as like this for that. Mm -hmm. And here's the key. Post close, there would always be at minimum one thing that would go to that client like two weeks later. Reason for that is because most agents have been paid and like, to your point, haven't talked to him, right? It's like, it's done. We're done. Moved and, on. Are, <laughs> and yeah, you've like, we've all moved on. We're done. You got the keys. It's over. So to get something weeks after you've been paid, that illustrates a whole other level of thoughtfulness. And that's kind of where a lot of other stuff in Client Giant takes its form is constantly piercing through that, that professionalism to make a friend, to make someone, uh, to make the relationship feel very, very personal without calling them every quarter to say, hey, you know. Yeah, I got to share the story that. with you. So I just closed... Uh... I shouldn't say just, it was middle of last year. I closed okay. a transaction with a couple who had a condo in Boulder, Colorado, and they'd owned it since the 90s. And it had been a rental for about 30 years. And she sold it. And it was her first condo she ever owned. And so she's super emotional. And, you know, and this is an older couple. And after the closing, she says, can I, can I take you for a drink and some appetites? Can we take you for a drink and some appetizers? And I said, sure. Right. And I, I didn't have anything behind it. And she lit up like she was so excited. And uh, so we go to now we go we go across the street to some restaurant. We sit down and we're talking and she starts telling me that she had another real estate agent that she had been 
in contact with uh, over the past uh, tw- 20 years, you know? And she says, but he did, he only cared about, he only reached out to me because he cared about the transaction. He didn't, he never reached out to me um, to, you know, to, to build a relationship or to be a friend and you're so nice. And it's just so nice that you want to come, you know, to, to lunch with us and whatever. So I was just thinking about this just this week. I was thinking, boy, I'm not being, I'm not fulfilling her expectation of me right now, but I feel I guilty because she's really sweet. <laughs> I've I've got everything worked out for you, Sean, and I I'm gonna set you up with uh with your first one, and you're gonna lose your mind. Um, one of the things I started implementing, you know, the movie box, all this stuff, that eventually evolved into what we call a transaction package. It's like six to ten touches during and after, you know. Um, some of that includes they get wine and dine at a dinner with round trip transportation, all the things I'm not attending, but they get. Um, that's a package. After that, we have a retention plan called top of mind, which is what you got to put your client on. So top of mind, is, it quite literally does that, right? But they get four no reason gifts a year. So it's not, you know, like when you call someone, you're like, oh, you should call and check in. At the end of the day, like the person on the other end is like, dude, I know why you're calling. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, Okay, you can ask how I'm doing, you can ask how my holiday was, you can ask all this stuff, but eventually you're going to get to the ask, which is, is there anyone you know, or what, yeah. you know, like, so. Who do you know that wants to yeah. buy a home, sell a home, or yeah. invest in real estate that I can call today? Yes. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so if you want to avoid all that awkwardness and be done with it and actually do something meaningful and thoughtful without spending any time or, you know, any logistics on your own. That's what you would do. It's called top of mind. It's four gifts a year. The gifts are thoughtful. They're relevant. Um, and they do not point to your business whatsoever. So they have no branding on them. There's no tchotchkes. There's no cheap bullshit in any of it. It's actually a nice, thoughtful gift with a message from you to her. And that's it. And um, and watch what happens to your mm. referral business. Watch what happens, especially when you do like 100 of them at a time. And boom, 100 people who you know, trust, they, they know and trust you. They've done business with you. 100 people are surprised with a random gift on January 11th for no reason. Watch what happens with your referrals. I'm assuming you come from the philosophy that the more touches and the quality touches, the more referrals you're going to get than, you know, obviously just sending a postcard once a month, right? Um, yeah which most agents don't do that. It's like 85% of real estate agents never talk to their client after closing. At least I send them a postcard. (laughs) Yeah. So here's my challenge. Here's what I would say to these people. So lots of times, you know, we believe more is better. Um, But if you were to think about like the postcards that go out, right. It's like, well, where do you open your mail? I open it over the trash can. Right. And, and I just drop any postcard. I can't even tell you if I've even looked at what the, what it says on the postcard. I feel it. I drop it. You know, that's just what it is. So it, it's pretty funny because it's all counterintuitive. A lot of these agents, they'll drop a couple thousand bucks on thousands of postcards with like next to zero conversion on it. And then it's like, what would it look like if you dropped a thousand dollars on each one of those 12 clients? Right? Like, what would that look like if you're making a hundred or 200 or whatever it is, and you dropped 10%, which is a lot, right? It doesn't have to be that much, but that's like what I did. I would drop. Well, I think your marketing budget should be 10%. And, okay. and if, if you don't have, if you don't have the business yet, it should be 10% of the business you're trying to build. Because I think the number one mistake in t- teaching agents how to sell real estate is, is lowering that expectation that you're going to be able to do this on a bootstrap. This is yes. an investment based business. You know, you've got to put money in. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's say this, Sean, what's an average commission in your market? Um, well, I, let's use a number like 15,000. Let's use 15. That's a good number. 15,000. Okay. So that's, that's high. I mean, yeah. that's, 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 that's really high. Okay. So here's what I want to do. Let's say that, and 10% is going to be high in this example, but let's just say $1,500 is spent on that client. What can you do for $1,500? Um, I'll tell you exactly what I would do. The boxes thing is a no-brainer. The the gift at the milestone of contingency mode, no-brainer. Post-close, um, I do a personalized gift that's actually catered to their interests. So your client from six months ago, I'd say, what makes her tick? I saw in her house that she loves 
the Rockies. I love that she, that she does this or whatever. Okay, I'm going to build a whole gift specific to her interest, and it's going to show up at her door, you know, four weeks after closing. Damn, that's impressive. Two months after, I'm going to send a professional cleaner to her house to say, hey, I know you've you've been in your new spot for two months. Could probably use a cleaning. This one's on me, whatever. You're pampering her when the deal has been done for a long time. Why is Sean still doing this stuff? And then do the quarterly gifts and whatnot. And pro you're probably not even close to $1,500 at this point. Right. Now, so here's what happens for the newer agents that you mentioned earlier that have like 12 clients or whatever. They have what a limited happens, budget, right? Their budget's not sure. quite as strong. I'd say spend the money on, and 10% might be high, but at least five. And it's money that, you, that you've just earned, right? So it's not like go it, reach in this pocket to pay. It's like, okay, of this 15K or of 10K or whatever, before I touch any of it, I know $500 is going to go toward this. Like if you can get in that mindset, you will do very, very well for yourself. Mm -hmm. And so here's what happens. Those 12 people, these aren't just like Sean's clients anymore. They're like, die hard Sean advocates, right? Mm -hmm. Like, so what ends up happening is I call this the difference between a passive referral and a passionate referral. So a passive referral is like that same client is out to dinner with another couple or something. And they're like, oh yeah, we're thinking about selling our house. And like, oh, well, Sean was really nice. He was good. He was great. You should call him. They're like, oh, well, we actually have someone, but thank you. They're like, okay. Like that's where it ends. Like they're like, I did yep. my part, right? That's a passive referral. A passionate referral is they're like, yeah, we actually found someone. We're going to interview him this weekend. And I think we're going to hire them. And they're like, stop everything. Cancel that appointment. You're hiring Sean. Let me tell you what this guy did for us. First of all, we had moving boxes sent to us. We had this. He sent us to dinner. We had a home cleaner two months after we moved in when the deal was completely done. The guy takes care of us all the time. He sends us little surprises, letting us know he's thinking about us. I cannot recommend him enough. You are stupid if you don't call Sean. And and we think like, wow, would someone really do that? We do it for free all day long. Like you recommend your favorite movie to someone or like your favorite restaurant. You do it so passionately because you will get fulfillment knowing that they have experienced what you have. So, yeah. so and you, you want to be engaged people, and you want to be engaged to hear what they thought of it afterwards too, right? You're excited to follow absolutely. up and go, what did you think? <laughs> exactly. So now you, these 12 people for this new salesperson, these 12 people are your sales force. Yeah. Forget the postcards. You have 12 people selling you every day. So that's why we say you're creating an army of repeat and referral business. And now we have years of data to prove this. So it's not even just a hypothesis. It is proof, like hands down. So I'll give you an example. Again, I don't want this to be a client giant commercial. So do this yourself if you want to do it. But let's say yeah, top I think mind, that's fair. You could do this yourself. Try to, try, and, to, and, try, try and do it yourself. Yeah. And all the uh, transparency. No, I have tried this. I have. I, tr I had sent out cards. I've had mailbox power. I have all the systems. I pay all the money. Guess what sure. I don't do? Yeah. Go well, online okay. and at click send of, every month. <laughs> at, at the end of the day, if if there's people on this uh, listening right now and, and they email me and say, hey, I did all of this myself, nothing would make me happier. That's the honest to God truth. So um, so with something like top of mind, it's 99 bucks a year per client. Call it 100 bucks. So 25 bucks a quarter per person. So Let's say, Sean, put 100 of your past clients on this, 100 of them, okay? And you're like, holy shit, that's like 10,000 bucks. Like, yeah, sounds like it's two-thirds of one commission check to me. So, right. okay, so 100 people all getting quarterly gifts. That's 400 gifts, right, in a year. That means 398 of them would go absolutely sideways, right? Like let's assume 398 of them get you zero, nothing at all. And only two of them out of 400 connect, you just doubled your money, right? Yeah. Like your $15,000, you just brought in 30 grand. So you've actually tripled your money, right? Cause you spent 10 and you brought in 30. Like, so that's why right. when people use this, they're like, okay, I'm just going to put more people and more people. Cause well, it's like and there's impossible a, to lose. And there's another benefit though, that if, if you're a newer agent, there's another huge benefit with referral business. Referral business doesn't tend to shop you. They don't tend to argue with you nearly as much over commission, right? Like you go out on a lead, like I'm a marketer, right? So I've always generated my business through advertising, you know, driving in fresh leads, going out, doing, you know, managing the objection handlers, getting it signed. 
well, you're going up today, you're going up against, you know, publicly traded companies, like, you know, discount companies, buyout companies, like your objection handlers, you better be sharp if you're dealing with the public right now, because th they have a lot of options. They, and I love it. I love the fact that there's more options because I, I can't solve every single problem out there, right? Um, but there's options out there for people. So I think it's great. But referral business, they don't tend to shop around, argue, you know, yeah, of course, they're going to say, can you do better on your commission? Of course, they're going to ask, right? They should ask. Um, but it's not nearly as difficult to overcome those objections, you know, so it's a yeah, better you, clientele. It's a better transaction. You, you took the words right out of my mouth. So, so, you know, you got the people that are fanning out the postcards. Think, forget about it. Let's assume conversion is great. You're, the person that's calling you off of the postcard is not the same person that's calling you that was referred by your client six months ago. This, right. These are completely different people. One is grinding you on your commission. They're challenging your, your knowledge, all this stuff. The other one is a red hot referral that this is your business to lose, right? right. So the, the, the postcard person calls you, you don't answer your phone, they're on to the next. This person calls you, you don't pick up, they will wait for you to call back. Yeah. Oh yeah, no doubt. But you better so, call back anyways. <laughs> but yeah, and you and you will call back. But that's the you whole call point back because you spent a hundred bucks on them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Our favorite, our favorite source of business is hands down referrals. It's it's like that's the low hanging fruit. You want that. So if you could maximize that, this is something I would say too. Going into twenty twenty two, if you look at a pie chart of what you do to get business, what sliver of it is getting your favorite source? You know, and what what does that look like? Oh yeah, I do, I do pop eyes or whatever. It's like okay, well, again, do would you want someone to just show up at your office unannounced and be like, hey, Sean, I'm here to pop by? Like I'd be like, do and like I I don't do that. It does I mean, freak people out sometimes. Yeah, I I don't do it. I never did it, but I also don't do it on the receiving side. So if someone's here right now, they will just sit there and they'll wait for hours. I, I'm not gonna engage because I I will not reward the bad behavior of you showing up to my office like assuming I'm just ready to chat with you about whatever the hell. That's, that's like rude, you know, like shoot me a text. Before we, we cut this short, I want to make sure we, we double back and we touch on the demographic of agent that's listening right now. That is, hey, you know what? I don't have a clientele. I don't have a database. I don't have an SOI. So when I got into real estate, I was 21 years old. I grew up in a trailer park in the mountains in Colorado, right? My friends were not buying and selling real estate. <laughs> yeah, everyone's got a story, man. Yeah, you know? so. If I'm an agent, I'm listening to two questions. One, I don't have a sphere or, or I don't have a, 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 a past client database. Does, does, does your program work or how would you, how would Jay handle that? Let's not even talk about client giant per se, but how would Jay handle that? Or um, if I was wanting to generate business, how would Jay handle that? Okay. So We've all been in the in the shoes of the first person, right? Like starting something from nothing, which is really in the beginning, you don't have the resources, but you got all the time in the world. So you're going to test all kinds of stuff. There's a bunch of different things that you that you can do and you can see what will drum up business to acquire that client. Um, a lot of a lot of people do this through open houses as an example, right? It's all it costs is your is your time pretty much. You can go sit on other people's open houses, you start to engage with people, you start to learn the face-to-face -face rejection, the face-to-face -face conversion, all that stuff. Um, and there's really endless um avenues you can go down with this. But for the sphere, like the friends and the family and all that stuff, um what I would do and what I have done, and I still do to this day, is people who have never bought a house with me before, and, and maybe they never will, um, I still give them a peek into how I do business. So, um, for example, there's probably a dozen or so people in my life that are on top of mind with me personally that um, never bought a home with me or and, and maybe never will, you know, but they're like friends or whatever. And really, for me, the reason I have it on there is because if anyone ever asks, what does Jay do, they can speak to it really well. But similarly, as a real estate agent, they would say, um, well, this is like what Sean does to take care of people, you know? And so right. it's kind of cool because whether they bought it or not is kind of irrelevant. What What's relevant is I'm getting a glimpse into how this person runs their business, and I really admire and respect that, and it's worth me talking about. Um, the second piece of that, which was um, – what was it retention? What was the second piece? No, of the question? second one was like if you wanted to generate business from it, like you know, from a marketing standpoint, you know, um, you know, farming, those kind of things. Oh, got it. Yeah. Got it. So, 
So yeah, for for that, totally not um, in the wheelhouse of anything mentioned on client giant. That's only for past client. I mean, some people are like, oh yeah, I'm gonna plug my whole farm into it. Don't do that. It's not it's not gonna have the same effect at all. Um, this is I love the fact that do. you are you say that because so many people say, oh yeah, oh the, the, my product fixes everything. <laughs> yeah, no, it it absolutely does not. And and I would actually discourage you from doing it because then you you're setting your up for yourself up for a negative experience. The way I'm pro- I I propose it as the use case, that is the use case, and I will be shocked if it doesn't work for you. And I have countless data to show it will work. The other way. I do not believe it will work. I would never encourage someone to do it. And it's very inauthentic. And everything we're trying to do here is we don't even look at ourselves as a marketing company at all. We look at ourselves as a hospitality company. It's like Mm. taking care of people, um, really showing like true thoughtfulness. And by plugging your farm into this, that's not what we do. So to acquire, um, you know, for a new agent listening to this, I would recommend not spending a ton of money. Um, but to Sean's point, don't expect to like make this a hundred percent bootstrap business. Like this is 100, yeah. like when people are like, Oh yeah, but that brokerage wants to charge me X where like, aren't you trying to get trained or like, you know, like what did you think was going to happen? Like what business can you start for a few hundred dollars a year? You know? Um, so be prepared to invest, but in terms of like shortcuts right out of the gate, I, I don't wreck. Oh, I'm going to put an an ad out in uh, this new magazine, or I'm going to buy this thing that this coach is selling or whatever. It's like, I probably would put some sweat equity in to, to yeah. start acquiring. Um, open house is a great way to do that. Um, and there's so many different paths. I mean, there's people that make a million dollars a year calling expireds, right? Like it's like yeah. as, as, as obscure that is like, it's not for me, but it could be for you, you know? Um, but a lot of those first couple of years is stress testing all the different avenues to see, okay, in the last 12 months, I had 12 closings, what percentage came from this and what percentage came from that, and then start to go down that path. And the, and the biggest tech takeaway I would say of this, for those that even have closed a few deals, ask yourself what your favorite source of business is. Is it from open houses? Is it from social? Is it from door knocking postcards? Is it the red hot referrals? I'd be willing to bet almost every single person's is going to be the referrals. Then I would look at what your strategies are to acquire business and what is your referral strategy? Do you even have one? And that's kind of the paradox of the whole thing, right? Is people are like, oh, referrals are the best. Like, what do you do to get referrals? I'm like, nothing. It's like, yeah. So, <laughs> referrals are the best. What's your strategy? Ah, I don't have yeah. one. <laughs> Let's start there. Start there. Start doing things that are going to yield the result you want. Because like, oh, I do postcards. It's like, even if you win at that strategy, you're not getting your favorite source, you know? Right. So, you know, what, and what I put together, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, for people who are in my situation who have been a real estate agent for a while, you lost touch with your clientele, you got busy, whatever reason, you don't have to go back and put them all into a system like this. Pick your raving fans, 50 to 75, you said 100. Um, 100 times 100 sounded like a lot of money to me. So, I'm thinking 50 to 75. Put them in the program, your top refers, whatever, and start doing something, you know, because yeah. anybody who's been in the business five years, you should have a, a budget set aside for, for marketing. And if you don't, you need, to, you need to sell that BMW and go buy a Honda and put the money into marketing so you can afford that BMW. <laughs> yeah, well, well said. And I, at the end of the day, I really think like uh, start with a good sample size. doesn't matter 50, 75, 100, whatever you feel comfortable with, but some sample size, if you put five people on, it's not enough to test. You know, it's gotta be, you gotta have some data to work with. Right. Um, but then just watch the results on one gifting cycle, one quarter. And I guarantee you're going to put more people on. Like, I wish that I wish client giant was thriving because people want to be so nice to us. That's not what happens. What happens is they selfishly want to make more money and they, and they put more people on things like top of mind. And when those renewals hit, think about this. This is even more validating. If you, let's say you spent 10 grand today for hundred people on top of mind and you're like, cross your fingers, hope this works. That's one thing. That's not the win for me. The win is next year when your renewal hits and you're pumped. Like, right. If you're like, oh, I'm not going to do it again this year. It's like, oh, that sucks. That's, that kills the whole vibe for me. Cause that means it didn't work for Sean or he didn't see the value in it. But when, when those renewals We've hit. We've all spent and, that money on those online 100 companies 100 <laughs> percent. how do i it get all, out of this contract you can't totally <laughs> so we wanted to we, everything is about keep it real do things that really matter and and just let the let the data do the talking just let and then from there you can take care of people yeah
Jay, this has been a pleasure, man. I appreciate your time today. And if people need to get a hold of you, where do they reach you? Yeah, so um, our Instagram handle is the client giant. So you can find us pretty much every handle, the client giant. I personally am not on social media, but you can get in touch with anyone and everyone on our team um, through that. And um, and if you want to speak with me directly, um, you just make a mention of that in that DM and someone will connect you with me. I love it, man. You're going to have to coach me on how to get off social media because I need to leave. <laughs> I am ready yeah. to exit. Just deactivate everything. You'll never look back. Oh, well, that sounds good. Thank you, Jay. I really appreciate it. Have a great week. Thanks, Sean.